I'm Nona Cheeks. I lead the Strategic Partnerships Office here at Goddard Space Flight Center. And I just want to go a little back in history um, and how I came to know Mersey and how we came about this presentation today. Uh, back in the late 70s, I was working in the uh, engineering organization. And at that time, I was a clerical going to the University of Maryland. And as a clerical um, person, I was responsible for the uh, detectors branch at that time. Um, and Mersey was working on his PhD at the University of Maryland. And I probably need not say this to anyone that's a student. I was a starving student, couldn't afford a parking pass. Mersey would go to school at night working on his PhD. He'd come in the office in the day, hand me the pass. I'd leave in the day and I'd head over to Maryland to take my classes. So we had a little system going back then where we became very good friends. And um, so I worked with him, or I can say I take a little bit of credit in his PhD since I did the typing back then. We didn't have computers. So I was on a typewriter back then, typing all the equations, uh, Mersey breathing down my neck, making sure I got it right. And what became of this is uh, Mersey um, PhD and uh, doing work in detectors. Um, also during that time, we were one of two centers, still one of two centers, leading the way in detector development. I guess everyone knows the other center is JPL. And why I find this presentation of most important to us as the Goddard community is, um, leading the strategic partnership effort, leading the tech transfer effort, and the SBIR effort, I get around to most of the centers. And um, being responsible for partnerships, we kind of work with each other or we kind of learn from each other across the 10 centers on how we go about strategizing and putting partnerships in place. And uh, we do a lot of partnerships with industry. And I recall about two years ago, maybe three years ago, I was at Johnson Space Center. And the folks at Johnson's Life Science Center was interested in NIH and 270 and what the state of Maryland could do for them. And I said, well, you know, to play this game, we're very interested in the energy companies that you have in the Texas area, and what can we you do for us? And there were, there was a lot of interest in detector technology, only to learn the people I was sitting around the table with at Johnson said, they pointed, well, Chevron, I'll go ahead and let you know who, they pointed Chevron to work with JPL because JPL was the lead center of detectors. Now, of course, my colleague here, who I grew up with at the center, doing a lot of detector work, I was incensed, very concerned about that. So when this presentation was given back in 2017, Luda, maybe? August of 2017, this presentation you're about to hear today was given. Um, I thought it was important that people hear this, that you understand how we came about developing detectors. It started with the COBE mission, the need, but you also understand that there are two NASA centers that really lead the way in detectors, and we'd like to keep this going in this direction, and that is Goddard and JPL. And uh, Mersey being steady at this since the 19, late 1970s, uh, still involved, um, very passionate about this. Um, certainly there's a legacy for him to lead, and certainly there's something for all of us to learn, and that we know who we are better when we get out and we talk across the centers, when we talk in industry, we talk with other government agencies. So from here, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mersey so he can go ahead and give you his perspective, his experience in detector development, and certainly should help us as we go forward with what we're thinking as it relates to our mission work and new opportunities that we could be creating. All right, Mersey? Good. Well, thanks for that introduction, Nona. And what Nona didn't mention, though, is um, she did move on quite a bit after typing my thesis. And, and a lot of the work, and some of it I'll describe here, uh, we collaborated on many medical devices. And when she went to um, tech transfer and then into the office of commercialization, um, she was you know, responsible for, for making some of those projects occur. And, and I'll get into those shortly. But yeah, I started way back when. I look around and I think I'm pretty close to the first one in this room that I can recognize, maybe Randy? No, I might have everybody beat, sorry to say. 
So I put it from my perspective because um, really it's, it's work that I've been involved with. It's not everything that Goddard has done. Really it's just stuff that sort of I've experienced. And I broke the presentation down into sort of um, decades and semi-decades, uh, starting with prehistory and then the early history, and this is relative to detectors and, and microelectronic development, and then working our way uh, up to the present. So a little bit of prehistory. Um, when I first came here in 74, there were no, detectors were not uh, anything we were working on. Everything was uh, the development of custom integrated circuits. And in the early 70s, integrated circuits were a novelty, at least, and a technological marvel for NASA. Um, so in 1959, the year that Goddard came into existence was the same year the MOSFET uh, was invented. And some of you know Dave Dargo um, came to Goddard in 61, and his job was to set up laboratories to make custom integrated circuits for NASA missions. There was no other place doing this pretty much anywhere. So he was on his own. He had to, you know, convert the office spaces into laboratories, which had high-tech equipment back then, for high-temperature furnaces, photolithographic equipment, etching, ion implantation. He did this. And he made the first PMOS circuits for these missions that are listed. And really starting in the late 60s, early 70s, we're, we are the IC center for NASA. Nobody else is doing it. As I mentioned in 74, I get hired. And shortly after I'm hired, Jerry Lamb is hired. Um, some of you may remember Jerry. He uh, worked here um, until about 85. And between Jerry, myself, and Dargo, we had three engineers, six technicians, and we were responsible for uh, coming up with may ways to make custom integrated circuits, initially PMOS and then CMOS. And um, back then in the 70s, there was no electronics division, so we were part of the mechanical division. We were part of the same group that's in Building 5 with the machine shop. And I gave this talk a little over a year ago, and Dave did attend it. Um, and he really is the sort of grandfather of this, uh, organ of this part of uh, the organization. So in 64, CMOS is patented. And my role when I first came to Goddard, I had a sort of eclectic background. I did pre-med and engineering, so I had a lot of chemistry and, and then double E. And back then, integrated circuits were chemistry and, and double E. And it was a good fit. And to me, I couldn't have thought of anything more fun to be doing in 1974 than trying to learn how to make integrated circuits. And it was my role, uh, my job, my assignment to develop a, an integrated, a CMOS integrated circuit process for Goddard. Um, and we did that. And then concurrent with this, we're starting to build our own uh, custom CCDs. Initially, CCDs were just um, digital chips, chip registers. They weren't really imagers. And so we made some of those as well. And then in 1976, a couple years later, John Mather comes to Goddard and he brings Kobe with him. And with the advent of Kobe, we had to develop detectors technologies that we really hadn't been involved with up until that point, but we were responsible um, for starting to learn how to test detectors, how to make them, and, um, and, and the technologies that were involved uh, required us to learn cryogenics, um, testing capabilities down to liquid helium temperatures. All this stuff was brand new to us, probably brand new to a lot of people, except uh, maybe some researchers in, in universities who had been doing this. So in quick summary from 74 to 80, we're working on developing custom PMOS circuits, 
CMOS, and, and even to this day, you know, every electronic chip is basically a CMOS chip. And back then, you know, we were happy to make OR gates and NAND gates and inverters, chips that had maybe a dozen transistors, but it was a lot more compact than trying to do this with discretes, and that was a big thing for NASA. These days, of course, CMOS is used to make the processors in your computers, memory chips, microcontrollers, everything, but it's still uh, the same technology evolved over 40 years. So we're working on that. I list a couple others like DMOS and VMOS. These were technologies that we kind of created to compensate for our inability to buy new equipment every time it came out. So we were trying to accomplish things uh, by making new devices that you could have done if you had better equipment. So in 1980, just a reminder, we're doing this. Laptops are still 20 years into the future. The internet is 15 years into the future. I see layout is done by hand with a ruler and a pencil and a drafts person. Um, desktop computers, 10 years, and smartphones, which we all rely on um, almost uh, minute by minute these days, are 25 years into the future. So this technology is going on without a lot of the things that we take for granted today. When I look at this presentation, I just can't help but remember all the things we didn't have. And, and just taking it one step further, you know, we had to rely on scientific calculators, which were extremely expensive back then. You know, a, a scientific calculator cost maybe $300 in 1980. One of the real limitations is that information is not readily available. So all our technology upgrades we're learning uh, from journals. And the cycle time from the time somebody submits an article to the time you actually get to see it could be well over a year, maybe two years. So technology that occurred maybe two years earlier, you're finding out two years you know, after the fact. Whereas today, you know, we almost find out about it instantly. And as Nona points out, all papers were typed, um, no digital cameras, 1984 is still in the future, 2001, Space Odyssey, which we all saw at the time, was in the future, and now it's like 20 years ago. And then, but on the other column, I list all the technology limitations that uh, we had, and these really affected our ability to even though we had ideas about new devices, we couldn't make them because the equipment just didn't exist. Um, so for you, for those of you, and there are a few that are in uh, fabrication, these are all the things we didn't have. So this was all being done in Building 11 um, on the ground floor uh, in the South Wing primarily, which labs still exist, but back then it was a big chemistry lab. We had ion implanters, we had hazardous gases, had all sorts of things, but still lots of fun. If you look here, this is what the lab looked like. Uh, this is a wet chemistry lab. This is the computer that we needed to make a, a mask. So it would be hand laid out, then we'd actually have to type it out on, on uh, punch cards and then it would be converted to a magnetic tape and the tape would be sent to Westinghouse and then we get uh, masks back. And here is uh, evaporator, evaporation systems. These are high voltage, 3,000 to 5,000 electron volts systems that are, uh, like I said, just on the ground floor of Building 11. And it all worked quite well back then. So this is that same lab in the, the two that I just showed in the, in the 70s and 80s. And nowadays, they've been repurposed. So this is a, a cryogenic test lab, and this is an electronics lab. This stuff does not exist anymore on the ground floor of Building 11, except in one little area. You've got one. So this is a, an important graph. So it shows the minimum feature size, the smallest 
feature we could print for an integrated circuit. And that really limited, one, how fast the chip could run, and two, how many devices you could get in a, you know, per unit of area. And for us, we were starting, we always started, uh, from the time we started uh, in the 60s to really to the, to the early 90s, we were limited to 10 microns. And the reason is, is that the equipment that we bought in the 70s, that's all it could do. New equipment was made that could do much smaller feature sizes, but we couldn't go out and buy it every time the equipment was upgraded. Industry could. So we're sort of stuck in this 10 micron region because we don't have a half a million or a million dollars to buy a new stepper or mask aligner, but industry keeps moving. And pretty quick, you can see that they're at, you know, less than a micron, which means they can put many, many transistors in the same area that we can only put one. And they're running a lot faster. And this was a, a real a limitation to our abilities to really make um, sophisticated, high-density, small-feature devices. I get goosebumps every time I see this. So this is a, a custom chip we made. It's called the Gate Array, and this is my this was my assignment. I had to make this. This was the first CMOS chip, and and what this shows is uh, an array of about I think five to six hundred transistors with some diodes and a lot of feed throughs, and we just make the device up until the last step. The last step would be a metallization where we would connect these devices uh, according to the circuit we wanted to make. So it was really a very uh, ingenious process. Uh, it was uh, conceived by RCA and we kind of copied it um, with their help. And, uh, and then the next one shows what it looks like after you pattern it. So this is uh, the same gate array, but we put the metal mask on this uh, aluminum interconnect, and we made it into a 9-bit synchronous counter. And, uh, you know, I still have this in my, I mean, just to prove that here he is. This, is, this was made in probably 1975. I got lots of them in my office. I do not have the heart to throw them away, but <laughs> nobody's ever going to use them. But this, and it's a 2-inch wafer, and each one of those squares, if you can see, looks like that. Um, there's maybe 70 on here, and these were very, uh, very valuable back then. This is what the digital CCD looked like. Um, again, it was a shift register. Nobody had even thought about using it as an imager. And as I mentioned, we were trying to get creative. We couldn't make short channel, as we call them, small devices with our photolithographic equipment, so we tried doing it uh, with the capabilities we did have. So typically, this distance here would be about 10 or 15 microns, and that would be your channel length. So we developed a process called VMOS where we would cut this groove in, and we could make the actual distance that electrons had to travel much shorter, just this amount. And in this sense, we're simulating uh, making small, dense, faster devices without the expensive equipment we couldn't get. So at the beginning I mentioned, uh, you know, some of the collaborations um, that we did with Nona's office were, were medical. And it turns out that the stuff we do, and particularly in the 70s and in the 80s, um, you know, NASA was really the premier organization for coming and finding technological new things. And in the area we were working in, microelectronics, um, the, the biggest match tended to be the medical industry. They wanted to see what stuff we had they could use. So this is one that I got involved with, and I had an interest because of my, my background um, in working in this area, if I could. Uh, so in 77, um, 
when women, toward the last 24 hours of a pregnancy, they would monitor the fetus. And the way they would do this, believe it or not, is they had a screw electrode. And it was like a little corkscrew, and they would screw the electrode into the fetus's skull. And from this, and they'd have wires. And from this, they could monitor the health of the baby, the EKG and um, the baby's pH. And they said, look, this is really a miserable experience for the, uh, the mother who's about to give birth. Can we come up with something? So we developed a system where we, rather than have um, the mother hardwired to equipment in this configuration, you know, NASA was doing a lot of telemetry. Could you at least telemeter the signal? So we developed a system that could do that. And this is, a, and it's pretty crude, but it worked. And you know, these, these advances, they don't tend to be so much a huge accomplishment all at once. They're, they're little incremental accomplishments. And so this, you know, in 1977 was an incremental accomplishment that today, hopefully, you know, the woman doesn't have to deal with this at all. Um, another one in 79, um, spinal cord injuries uh, left people uh, paralyzed from the point of the injury down. And they were trying to develop techniques to regrow damaged um, nerves. And they said, look, uh, one thing we think might work is if we can put a electric field across the severed area, we could encourage nerves to regrowth according to that uh, uh, along the, the electric field lines. Can you come up with something to help us do that? So we made this little hybrid that would pulse and we made platinum electrodes that could be wrapped around both ends of the cord and, um, you know, in this fashion try and, and regrow nerves. And they did some tests on, on mice and they got some, you know, some results. Um, it's not something they do now, but back then it was probably used for 10 or 15 years of research in spinal cord uh, regrowth. And you look at this hybrid and it looks pretty sloppy, especially for us that do wire bonding in here. And even this, when it's encapsulated in these little batteries, but in 79, this was a state of the art. You know, these batteries had just come out. You know, we, we use them for everything now, but in 79, this was the first time. This was a custom chip. We're putting it all together, we're encapsulating. It can be implanted in um, an environment that's, that's very uh, hostile to electronics. And there's a, a list a few more later on of things like this. But as I mentioned, John Mather came, he brought Kobe. We are all now gonna start working on detectors. And this probably occurs or starts around, John came in 76 probably around 77, 78. And back then detectors were one single element, one pixel. We were happy to get signal out of one pixel, but there were a variety of materials to be explored. And, and here's, a, here's a list of the ones that we worked on here and the wavelengths that they responded. And you see, you get down to these very long wavelengths, we're getting quite creative. And for this channel, the very long 120 to 200 microns, we read a paper that said if you apply pressure to um, gallium dope germanium, you can make the wavelength go from 120 microns to 200 microns. And we said, okay, how do you do that? So we came up with this contraption. So we put our chunk of detector material in here and we had kind of a thumb screw and this was all in a in a Invar housing, a stainless steel housing, and we just tightened the screw and we're squashing this detector, and sure enough, we were able to watch as we applied pressure, the detector response go out to, to very long wavelengths. And the way we did this was using very cold black body sources, so they're very long wavelengths. And also to do this, we have to start using resistors that are on the order of 10 to the 10th ohms, which you don't really go by. So we had to make our own resistors as well. 
So it was really a, a, a whole, you know, bringing Kobe here was a challenge on many, many levels, not just detectors, but um, the electronics, of course, the cryogenics, and, and a whole host of technologies, but it was really pretty exciting. So here's the Kobe satellite here in a picture. Here is the liquid helium door. So Kobe is basically a big liquid helium door that was supposed to hold helium for nine months. And once you run out of helium, the mission's over. So you better get everything you need uh, before that happens. And these are the, band, the wavelength bands um, or the band that, uh, at least for the IR detectors, we had to cover. It was like one to, to 200 microns, more or less. So, you know, we all know, or most of us know, we were here when John uh, and the team uh, were recognized with the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics. And, you know, we had nine months uh, opportunity to get the, the signals back uh, before the helium ran out. John came when I gave this last year, and he said that they got everything they needed in the first 40 minutes of the mission. So, and this is the curve that shows that the uh, cosmic background has cooled from its Big Bang temperature to 2.7K. And, you know, we spent 15 years making it, and he got everything he needed. I mean, that's just unbelievable in 40 minutes. And, uh, no, but I list here a lot of the, technolo the technologies that we worked on here ultimately wound up in a, in a whole bunch of future missions. Um, particularly in um, Spitzer, Iraq, uh, with Harvey. And, uh, and then even today, we're still using some of the black body sources for the Lucy mission. Just recently, um, for the OSIRIS-REx, and I can't help but show the iconic photo of John receiving the Nobel Prize. But not to be outdone, um, after we were done with our work in 87, this is a group that worked on the detectors. Um, Carl's still here. That's me, believe it or not. And there's Dargo, who started this. Uh, that was the director at the time, Noel Hinners. And, and this was the group that was pretty much doing everything in the semiconductor uh, organization. In, in this time period. So we move into the 80s, and so we got a lot of experience working on single element detectors for COBE, and now we're gonna start trying to, one, converge on technologies that are the ones that really we wanna focus on. In COBE, we were trying to find uh, detectors that would work anywhere, and, and then uh, as we figured that out, there were a few areas that we really wanted to focus on. And we're, we're trying to um, sort of think ahead and figure out what materials we'll be able to use to make arrays. Up until this point, again, every detector is just one little chunk. And these are some of the technologies that, that we're pursuing from um, lead sulfide to platinum psilocyde, which was one of the first infrared detectors uh, to be made into arrays. And then we get into some of the things that I'm still pursuing, these quantum well detectors. Um, along the way, we got to make these laser diodes. That was a lot of fun, too. I mean, we, we'd make a little laser diode, and then you'd put voltage, and you could see the, the beam go, and it would be very diverse. And then as soon as it lasered, it would focus to a point. And we'd sit there and play with this all day long, just well, watch this, watch this. <laughs> and then we had to make uh, high value resistors and then these different versions of JFETs. Uh, JFETs are just another type of transistor, but they can be low noise and they're very useful uh, for very sensitive uh, detector applications. So from 80 to 90 in summary, you know, we're starting to get into this large format readout chips. I won't go into a lot of detail about readout chips, but they're necessary to get the signals out of the detectors. The detectors 
convert a photon to an electron, and then this readout chip takes the electron and converts it to a voltage. And you need that step, so we, we, we can't deal with electrons or photons, but we can deal with voltages. And when you see all this displayed uh, on your screens or in any, you know, in any format, it's always in some form of voltage. We have to worry about this, new cryogenic methods to 1.4 Kelvin. Um, 1.4 Kelvin is close to absolute zero. So you're like minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. New packaging techniques, new epoxies, new, new temperature sensors, all sorts of new equipment become available in the 80s. Um, diagnostic equipment, spectrum analyzers, all this stuff that we needed to do. Um, really sensitive, advanced detector characterization with. We get this. We finally get a integrated circuit layout system that doesn't involve drawing things by hand. We can do it by computer. And this was really, and this is, you know, to me not that long ago, but I guess it is in some people's perspective. Um, we now have uh, computer systems to design and do analysis, but we're, all, but we're still doing all this in Building 11. And periodically, because it is a hazardous operation, we would evacuate the building. Maybe, maybe a little more than once a year. And these evacuations typically brought the fire department. Occasionally, we'd have CNN flying overhead in the, towards the, in the early 90s, I remember one incident. And um, it was a problem. And, the, and most of the people in Building 11 had nothing to do with this. So they would be victims, and they were like, what the hell's going on down there? And we were a safety issue. So before I go further, let me just list some of the, some of the people here that, uh, that we hired. Um, there was a big hiring push in the early 80s. And um, some of the people, I think, are in this room. The people in red are the people that were hired into our branch and moved on into other organizations at Goddard. So Steve Graham, Shreether, McCluskey, Don, Caleb, Carl, Travis are still here. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think they're all still here, but they're in different organizations. But they all started in the detector uh, in microelectronics. And I know Shreether had to actually fabricate um, devices because he worked for me at the time. So. In this time period, we're starting to really expand what we do. One of the things is this what's called Quaddle facility, which people thought was sort of, a, you know, a reference to a duck, but uh, and it, and we changed it. But the Quaddle facility was they were thinking about building us a new facility to get us out of the building primarily, uh, but. From our perspective, it was a new, brand new technological wafer fab, which was great, even though to somebody else it was get us out of the building. Um, and these are the things we're going to pursue with it. So in this ha last half, this was a tough part of the 1980 to 1990 decade. There were three things that happened late in this decade. Um, as I mentioned, we had been a major safety concern. Something that, a little more interesting, in 85, um, the US and Japan were having a big trade war over semiconductor uh, memory chips. And uh, they came to what's called the US-Japan uh, US Semiconductor Trade Agreement. And in that agreement, the Japanese agreed to allow us, the US, to go over to Japan and determine exactly how much it costs for them to make memory chips. Up until that point, they were practically giving away memory chips in the U.S. in an attempt to take over the market, put the U.S. industry out of business. U.S. industry complained and the Commerce Department had to answer, and so we had this agreement. For five years, we'd go over there, we'd tell them they better not sell them 
cheaper than this price and we'd fix the price based on what it cost them to make. So they didn't have anybody at the Commerce Department who knew anything about semiconductors or CMOS or chips and they asked me to be the advisor. So I, we agreed, um, I would help them here and for five years every couple months I'd go to Japan with the Commerce team and we'd fix the prices that they were allowed to sell chips. So that part isn't the point. What it did do, though, is allow me to go into their labs and see what they were doing. And it was like mind-blowing. Here I am still thinking about this, my little pride and joy, that I thought, hey, this is like the greatest thing in the world. And then I go see what they're doing, and it was embarrassing to me how far ahead they were. So I come back, and I say, you're not, I mean, you're just not going to believe what they're doing. And so while I'm making this still in some sense that had a thousand devices, Hitachi is making a 250,000 transistor device. And this is what it looks like. This is 256, what we call 256K, a dynamic RAM chip. And this thing that I made would consume about that much of their space. And these look black, but I'm trying to, it's so dense and there's so many devices in there, you can't see them. I'm trying to bring it out, but even when I'm trying to bring it out in a microscope, you still can't see it. But there are 32,000 transistors in this one block. And I was able to expand this, and you can see the features. And these are probably 18 or 20 layers deep. And I'm like, okay, we are really way behind. So, you know, this part of the problem, as I said, is the information just wasn't available in real time. Yeah, we found out about this probably in 1987 or 86, but we had to go find it in journals. You couldn't find it on the internet and we had to wait for them to publish it. And I did bring a journal here. There was one issue, a special issue that uh, IEEE did on memory chips and the entire journal is filled with articles submitted by the Japanese, none by the US. And we were that far behind. So I come back and I tell them this and then the third really horrible thing that occurs is that the the Challenger explodes, and we're paralyzed for two years. Nothing happens. No launches. We're trying to figure out what, what's the next step. But one good thing does occur. There's some money at NASA. They want to spend it on something, and they say, hey, give us a proposal for a new facility. And this is the memo that comes out. And back then, yeah, it's still typed. And I'm up to give a little talk on what a new facility would look like. So these are the view graphs. There's nine view graphs. I give a nine view graph presentation defining what are, and here's that um, graph that shows just how far behind we are. And I tell them the things we're gonna do is pretty straightforward. I didn't have any idea about this. I'll get into this a little later about MEMS. But we did have a good idea uh, of the things we needed to improve our technology on. And, you know, they really, they care. This is what they cared about. $3.9 million, and yeah, we need about 600 k for new equipment, and, you know, we have a chance to get back in the game. Five years later, here's the crack architectural team designing the uh, DDL, the Detector Development Lab. And Christine's still here, Carl's still here. Same team that won the Kobe uh, Award, you know, for, for, for supporting Kobe. Here we are looking at drawings. And sure enough, we do get the facility. And so we went from this, which I showed earlier, into this really wonderful facility. And in 94, it was, and, it, and even to this day, it's still one of NASA's premier showcase facilities. Whenever there's a VIP and they have enough time, 
we take them into the DDL. And you can see what it is, and we've made some really tremendous devices there. So now we have to really start thinking about, you know, starting in, in 81, 82, the early 80s, we have to go from single element detectors, one pixel, into multi-element arrays so we can make actual images instead of just collecting photons in a bucket. Um, and we have to cover a very broad spectrum uh, from the UV to the far infrared. And in order to do this, really, and this didn't start occurring probably until the late 80s, maybe even early 90s, um, until we had lab computers. He just couldn't do any of this stuff without computer technology. And even though we would have loved to, we're still waiting for things to be invented so we can move forward. We have to develop, even after we start developing detector arrays, there's really no commercial software to interrogate it, to read it, to display it. So we have to make our own programs to display the the images. So here it says NASA science mission require detectors and some would have me say all NASA science missions require detectors. Probably a little risky to say all but it's pretty close to all. And um, as I've mentioned numerous times in the 70s and early 80s we were one pixel. Your iPhone 10 has two and a half million pixels. So you can see just the evolution there. As I said, we were limited with one pixel. You're just detecting photons. You're not making pictures or images easily. Um, there were uh, many, many different materials available to make infrared detectors requiring all different operating temperatures. And, and that was a challenge, and it's still a challenge even to today to run these detectors. Um, we somewhat take it for granted when they're running, but the cryogenics and the cooler technology is quite complex, you know, to keep something at minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, especially in the satellite. So this was one of the first devices we made in 81 that had uh, as an array. It was lead sulfide, this black stuff's lead sulfide. We had to use hydrogen sulfide gas to make it, and that was a building evacuate, evacuator once. And here is a small eight element array, um, a linear array, one of the first multiple or multi-element detectors on a chip. And this, you know, was really a first array, and this is a nine element. These are nine individual pixels of platinum silicide. And it looks pretty rudimentary, but just going from one pixel to nine was a pretty big step. And then we get into the area of CCDs. And the CCDs, um, charge coupled devices, really opened up the area for large, large format arrays detector arrays in the visible area. And, and we, we start working in this area, and some of you know Janicek from way back and Dick Bredhauer. Uh, we started our collaborations in the 80s and probably went for a good 20 years to develop advanced CCDs. And these are some of the missions we did it with. And I'll, I'll mention this FBI in a moment. So these are some of the early CCDs we're making. In, and since it was all new, we were getting quite creative with our ability to design and quickly fabricate them. And these are just a couple of designs we were trying out. This is one that was ultimately used for, for the Modus T. Modus T um, got canceled, but uh, the detector itself was, was quite successful. And it, it used a new technology called pin photodiodes um, but we did this and, you know, one of the things, one of the advantages of having this capability in-house is we could try different things. We could innovate. We could um, iteratively improve the process quite rapidly in-house, something you really can't do in industry. Every time you want to change something, you know you're starting from scratch. But we're very flexible here. 
So in 93, in say 15 years, from the late 70s to 93, we have evolved, the industry has evolved from single element detectors into arrays. And I list a whole variety of here, but you can see that this 1024 here by 1024, that's a 1 million pixel array now. And uh, it's a CCD, but you know, we're starting to, to get into other technologies as well. And, and the gallium arsenide quip um, was one of the first infrared, long, far infrared detector arrays uh, that were made. And we did that here as a collaboration with AT&T Bell Labs and uh, Rockwell. So finally in the late 80s and early 90s, new equipment is being invented that, invented that can help us make new types of devices. Um, metal organic MOCVD and MBE, molecular beam epitaxy, are systems that could deposit literally uh, one layer of atoms at a time. And this became very critical in making some of these advanced devices. And as I said, we developed in 90, uh, really the first uh, far infrared array, 128 by 128 quantum wall array. Um, we had to do it with three organizations. No single organization could have done it by itself. And and we were all sort of competitors, but we managed to, you know, come together for at least this one project and get this done. And we performed quite a few experiments with these, and, and even today, last week, we were performing experiments that were an evolution of this technology I'll show you later. So it was lots of fun doing things in the infrared and having cameras, so we start taking pictures of everything. So we're getting ready to do a flight and we're take, testing this outside in the middle of the night and we see this deer. And we can't see him with our eyes, but we see him in the infrared. And we thought, that, wow, that's pretty cool. And then of course we have to start trying to get portraits. This is uh, Jeff Travis playing bass. And you see all the thermal images here. So we're getting ready to fly this Quip camera, and back then it was based on liquid helium. And this is all the equipment that's going to go in the back of this plane, including this liquid helium tank. And so we load it in there. And you can see all this stuff's going to go in there. And the door does not close. And we're holding on to a pole and we're tethered in. And we fly this, and we're actually getting an infrared image of the wallops area. And I just couldn't help but put this last sentence is that clearly safety was our number one concern there. <laughs> but we didn't fall out. There were three of us in there. We made it. Um, so in 93, we're Shoemaker Levy Comets getting ready to hit Jupiter. And we thought, wow, that'd be pretty cool to see that in the infrared. So we take our camera uh, out to Haleakala and use uh, a DOD facility, and it's a 256 Mercat array that's getting ready to be used on NICMOS, a space telescope instrument. And here's the image. This is a space telescope image of the time lapse of the comet approaching Jupiter. And here's our image of the impact. And this was very exciting at the time. So now we're starting to get into some serious imaging here. And this is uh, this little M&M dispenser. And you pull his arm down and uh, M&M pops out. But we took this image with a CCD. And this was a 1K by 1K CCD. And in 1994, up until this point, all images are taken with the camera and film. And this is a digital image and you can actually see this dead column here and didn't bother us. If you saw that on your iPhone now, you'd probably smash it. <laughs> but um, this was a remarkably uh, high resolution, very clear photo. And so the FBI finds out about CCD imaging and many of us had our fingerprints done with ink and cards. And uh, 
the FBI has a gazillion of these cards on file. They weren't even thinking about using CCDs to actually take your image. What they wanted to do is convert all their cards to a digital library, and they were hoping that the CCD camera, they could photograph all the cards and then store it digitally. And so they gave us a card and they said, you have to make your image good enough so that we can identify the fingerprint from your image uh, without any problems. So this is the image we gave them. We took this with the CCD and they said, this is great. And so they actually started transferring their database into, uh, into digital images until they re somebody realized, hey, we can skip that step and just fingerprint you directly and take the, the image. But as I said, you know, these things occur incrementally. So I won't get into this, but in the 90s, there's just we're collaborating with lots of places in the country to do all sorts of things. Um, and this is just a list of the projects that the branch is supporting uh, in the next 10 years. And it's quite an impressive list. And some of it we're supplying hardware, some we're supplying support. And these are just some of the commercial applications. And this, you know, um, when Nona first introduced me, I mentioned that uh, many of the stuff we did outside of Goddard uh, was for medical applications. And, and here's a list of the things that we worked on. And, you know, it's a list we can be proud of. As I said, we made maybe in some cases a larger contribution than others. But the fact that we were there at all and NASA had a presence is a, you know, a really gratifying thing. So here's a list of the detectors that we're working on in the formats, and you can see the numbers are getting quite big. We're up to, um, you know, in one case, there's a 16 million pixel detector, and things have evolved quite a bit just in 10 years, from, say, the 80s to the 90s. And then we get into MEMS. So MEMS are microelectromechanical systems, whereas before everything we're making is in silicon, is transistor-based. And now there's enough um, equipment technology advances where we can start making things in silicon that actually move physically. And so we get quite creative there. And the silicon bridge chips and um, Black body calibrators, micro shutters, we spent, and micro mirrors, we spent many years working on. These are all things where uh, things move in silicon. So, in order to start testing these, the DCL, the Detector Characterization Lab, comes into existence around 1997. And it's really um, because of uh, Spitzer, Iraq. And that's when we really had to get into detector characterization at a, at a very large scale. Um, everything that I present from here on um, are slides that were made either from PowerPoint or something else. All the previous slides I had to take from pre a view graph presentation. Some of you don't even know what that is, I bet. Um, but here's pictures of some MEMS devices. These are actually suspended black body sources. You put a little voltage and they glow. And you can see now things are hanging, suspended. These are miniature wires. So they're suspended. These wires um, are straddling a gap. So it allows for electrical con connection, but, no, but very low thermal con con conduction. And this is a cross-section, again, used for Spitzer. Here's silicon actually being bent. We made it so thin that you can fold it. And this is another one. We made this uh, detector assembly for Gravity Pro B, but it's suspended um, on this pedestal. Uh, so this is sort of a more macro version of MEMS. Uh, but it made the cover of this um, optoelectronics world, laser focus. Here's some x-ray calorimeters. Again, these are all suspended devices. They're hollowed out, um, made uh, possible by 
uh, dry etching techniques, micro shutters. Ten years we worked on this. I think we're still working on it almost. <laughs> Um, these are little trap doors that open and close. The idea here being able to selectively block uh, light from celestial objects so you can see light from very dim objects. And these are going on James, uh, James Webb. It's just a cross section. So this is a micro shutter array. So we took an array, we shine light behind it. All the shutters are closed so no light comes through. And then we open it, and obviously all the light does come through. And these little black spots are shutters that don't open. And we can selectively open or close any one of these, or any multiple of one, um, which really is a key enabling element for the near-spec instrument on J James Webb. So we were invited, uh, the president of the Czech Republic was coming to town. They said, hey, NASA, we want you to go down there and meet with them. And I'm like, okay, what do you want us to do? And they said, hey, you know, just go down there and tell them something. So, so we go down there, there's about four of us. We go down there and we're trying to figure out what, what are we gonna say? So I, we were working on micro shutters. This is the coat of arms or the flag emblem of the Czech Republic, this thing that looks like it's on a low and brow label. Um, but we made this image with micro shutters. So you can see the, the white is the shutters are open and the black is closed. And we made a plaque and we put this image on. And I literally have like one minute to meet with the president and tell him what this is. I mean, the only thing he probably saw was NASA which is good, um, but you know, for us it was, you know, we had like two days to come up with something and this was pretty cool. So in 98, I'm starting to focus on these things. It starts, the, the branch is very big now. I'm focusing on my areas and people are, uh, other people are working on other things. These are the new hires. Again, the ones in red have moved on. They started in our branch, but they've moved on. Mahmoud is here. Um, anybody else that I think? Nope. But this, this is something that I do notice, and that is uh, starting in the early 2000s, we don't have a lot. We don't have the external technology transfer collaborations that we had early on. And there's some reasons for that. Um, as I mentioned, these are all projects that I worked on with tech transfer over the years. And most of them occurred before 2000. Pretty much nothing's occurring since then. Um, I just, I'm just emphasizing that it's kind of an aside. Uh, but now we're going to use the quips for Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. These are all made in-house. Um, this is just starting with a wafer that we make. We built this. It's all custom. Winds up in Landsat 8, Tears Instrument, gets launched. And this is kind of just a recap. This is a 1K by 1K quip camera, and we're still using liquid helium in 2005, but we're making very cool images. And you can see hot coffee being poured. 2007 is the advent of mechanical coolers. So they're still, they're, they're big, but they're not liquid helium, they're portable. You just plug it into a wall and your detector gets cold. This is really a remarkable technology advance. So this is the 1K. This is one we made here at Goddard, a 1K that has this little tiny cooler. This thing's about this big now. So all this stuff is in this little box. And I just show the evolution here. This is a liquid helium version. This is an early mechanical one. A little later, this is a video camcorder of the infrared. And this is one we just built in the last month really, we don't even need an operator. We can just push a button and walk away and this thing will start recording images. 
So I'll skip some of this. These are just some of the experiments we did here. We're out in the Mojave with a quip camera and we're just looking at caves to see if we can find them on Mars. And uh, we turned the camera on a cave, which is here, and let it run for 24 hours during the day. The cave's going to be colder than the outside. And then at night, the cave's going to be warmer. And we actually confirmed that. And, um, you know, they're trying to figure out if they can use this technology to find caves on Mars remotely because they think that's a good place to look for life. This is doing it. Here we are doing ground-based astronomy at Kid Peak. I think some of these people are in the room here. Um, so we're doing uh, some solar ob observations. And I'll just do this. We're just staring at the sun. This is some sunspots. And quite fortuitously, so don't blink. This takes about 10 seconds. You see these flares. And it was like unbelievable to us to see this image. Don's back there. Uh, he was responsible for it. So this was with our quick camera. This was, And we're still pursuing uh, infrared solar uh, imaging now at Big Bear, which is here. And this we did just maybe a month ago. We installed a quick camera into one of the, into the observatory and uh, we're looking uh, at the sun. And so after 30 years, we're finally coming to what's called SLS technology. And it's much more sensitive than QIPS. It operates at a warmer temperature. And we had an opportunity to build an instrument and put it on space station. So in about a week, it's gonna get launched to the ISS. Um, it's called the Compact Thermal Imager. And you can see now everything's really quite small. This is, of course, 2018, but no liquid helium. This thing runs at around 67K. And we did it kind of in a skunk works uh, mode. And then just last week, we've upgraded, and now we call this the Autonomous Thermal Imager. Whereas I said, we're using this Pixie 5 module, connects to the camera, you turn it on, you walk away, no operator. And you can come back and you'll have your video. And we did this, we flew over Goddard last Wednesday with this camera and here are the buildings. So this is building 23, here we are, in building 36. And this is building 12 and we just caught the edge of 22. Goddard campus. This is at 4,000 feet flying over. And here's the building 33 architectural wonder. You can see the, and here's building 32. And again, just to conclude, this is a list of the projects we're working on now. And you can see it's quite an impressive list. And so this guy was made in these ovens, these furnaces. And about two months ago, I walked down the hall and I see my furnaces being excessed. <laughs> it was like, broke my heart. So I got my last pictures. This is what they were in their heyday. And, and then on a happy note, I'd like to thank Nona, she's still here. <laughs> and, uh, and then Mamuda and Samantha, I'm not sure if she's still here, and uh, Lindsay for, for all their support. And then the final happy note is being known, uh, I think this was probably taken in the early, come up here. Come here. Well, we can reprise this photo. <laughs> And uh, I guess this is in the 80s. Come here. Here. See, see if. What's this? A little older. <laughs> I'm falling. And this is Nona now. And this is a list of our current contractors who really support all the work we do. So it's quite a big operation we have. 
And any of you that are on the other side of the campus, you know, if you had no idea that this exists, come over because there's a huge amount of capability and we can invent things, we can make them, we can reinvent them. And, you know, it's there to be used. That's it. So if any discussion or questions, I'd be happy to, yeah. Okay, I was just wondering uh, what your thoughts were on how the Japanese, just a few decades after World War II, were able to jump two, more than two orders of magnitude beyond you and what we were doing in this country. And as a, a corollary to that question, how that experience of witnessing what they had done affected your work habits and your outlook and your way of doing business. Right, so the first part of your question, the thing about the Japanese, which, uh, about their industry at the time, they had MIDI, which was their Ministry of Information and Technology or something like that. But it was a centralized government agency that there were five companies we were dealing with, Hitachi, Fujitsu, Mitsubishi, uh, Toshiba, and NEC. These five companies were all being coordinated by MIDI. And they all initially uh, were given a piece to solve. And, and they did it. And these companies were all also very vertically integrated. So in other words, they could make all the pieces they needed themselves. They didn't have to buy anything from anybody else. So they had a lot of things going for them that really this is kind of uh, what we almost refuse to do. We don't want the government telling us what to do. We don't want them directing us. Vertical integration really doesn't happen very often here. And they had that advantage. And then they worked their tails off. You know, and I'd go in there and I'd see these guys. We'd come in, I'd go in for a meeting and I'd say I'd want information. And there would be people that would spend the whole night there just getting the, and it would be there the next morning. I didn't know this was going on, but they were very, they were very determined. And um, so they had companies that were making the equipment they needed. They had, they were being directed to make new mask aligners. They had, they had robots. Now their robots back then were just conveyor belts moving things around, but that was robots to us back then. Um, they, just, they just approached it you know, from a very global perspective. They're gonna solve the whole problem at once. And, and as I said, they were very, indu they were very industrious. So this lasted for five years, this agreement. It expired and, and all the US industry was delighted because they didn't want to even try and compete with the Japanese anymore and they wanted these parts cheap. And we had been making them more expensive so they could get in the game. Um, this expired and then the Koreans, uh, a, a similar agreement was made with the Koreans because they were doing the same things. And I go over to Korea and I tell them about, you know, the Japanese, they're really, I mean, they're just like killing themselves here. And they would say, oh, Japanese are lazy. <laughs> and it was like, you know, and this is, this was the mindset. And this is, you know, you know, the determination they had. And now, um, you know, the Japanese aren't so much a player anymore. And the U.S. in terms of, uh, the, so the brain chips, they were making DRAMs, which are, you know, they're just one transistor and one capacitor basically per cell. No intelligence other than to read them out. The microprocessors uh, are really the technology that the U.S. owns. And there's a lot of intelligence in those microprocessors that really can't be duplicated elsewhere. They can copy the chips and make them. Um, but actually designing them, the U.S. is really on top there at the moment. Uh, looking back at the history, and do you think that we are now at the forefront of this technology? 
or somebody is somebody else is way ahead of us. I mean this sensor technology or so so the detectors um, you know are NASA has unique requirements. So in terms of detectors, we make things that nobody else wants to make because there's only going to be one or two of them or ten of them. So for example, micro shutters, we're the only ones that can make them. They could be made elsewhere, but there's just no market for it. Same with a lot of these detectors. Now, we are finding out that in the far infrared, the quantum well and the strain layer super lattice, people are starting to understand that these technologies will be quite useful for commercial applications, like monitoring crop health. And we're getting a lot of inquiries, say, from uh, companies in California that want to keep track of their vineyards and their agricultural, and they think that this technology will be useful, but they don't want to make it. They want to use it. And so right now, NASA has an edge because we are the ones that know how to make it and make systems out of it. But if it catches on commercially, one, if there is a commercial company willing to do it, we're happy to let them do it, and we just as soon buy it from them. Um, or if there isn't a commercial company willing to do it, we'll collaborate with them and get them up and running. The thing that comes to my mind is something like quantum sensing, quantum detectors. I don't think that there's much work here. So, so there's a number of areas of quantum that we're covering. I think there's quantum computing, there's quantum detectors. But again, a lot of this stuff is onesie, twosies. And if it's onesie, twosies, we have a chance to keep at the forefront. But if there is a commercial application, we don't have the resources that some of these companies have to put into it. So anyway, we have a lot of time. Uh after the presentation to keep talking to Mercy, but uh, Non and I are very happy to be able to hear this story in terms of the evolution of detectors. I remember that one day I was in Building 11 and going to my office, I stopped by to talk to Mercy and he's in a pile of pictures and going through his, his uh, archives view in graphs. order to view graphs, all view graphs that he started to show me in order to do and prepare his presentation. So he has vested a lot of time, a lot of energy to share with us, you know, the history that he has put together. So uh, we would like to give you this small certificate okay. for appreciation, sharing your knowledge and expertise and history as part of the systems engineering seminar. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Jamala. You. It's been a pleasure. by maybe 30 minutes. I think this is a great talk. I think it's very exciting. And as I said on the onset, it's very important for us to know who we are, understand Mersey's legacy here, understand Goddard's legacy as it relates to detectors. So we thank you. And hang around and ask Mersey um, questions. If you have them, you're good on time. Yeah, I'm okay, good. I, I'm, yeah, so what, one thing I didn't, I brought all this stuff up. I forgot to show up. But when I was making this, this is what I was seeing. <laughs> So not only were they making 256K DRAMs, I'm making them on these little two-inch wafers. They're making them on this. And it's like, <laughs> what was I thinking about? <laughs> but not to be outdone, we make them on eight-inch now. Each one of these, each one of those is 250,000. Each one of these squares is one million elements. Oh, no. So, yeah. yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> So sorry, but thank you all again. Thank you for coming.